Good morning. Welcome to St. Mary's. Welcome to God's house where it is good for us to be together to offer our gifts of praise and thanksgiving uh, right here together and also with those worshiping with us and joining online. I uh, welcome you as well. I hope that by now you have gotten a chance to get a bulletin that will help guide you through the liturgy. There's a link to the bulletin in the description to the video online. And also in the bulletin, there's a number of announcements that pertain to life and ministry here at St. Mary's. I am going to highlight a couple of them right away, though. First of all, in addition to welcoming all of you, there's a welcome back and a welcome in a different role to Elizabeth Maxwell, who is serving as the organist uh, this morning while Sharon, our organist and choir master, is away. Thank you so much for sharing your gifts uh, in leading us in this part of the liturgy today, Elizabeth. Um, also, today was the ministry fair in between the two services, along with the breakfast that have kicked off again. Thank you so much to everyone who was a part of that and cooking and serving the food, uh, uh, providing a time of, of hospitality and fellowship. And if you were not able to see what was in the ministry fair uh, beforehand, know that I think there will be some uh, of those things still available to see in Mosley Hall and maybe even in uh, the yard as you depart today. Hope you'll be able to take a look at those things and see all of the wonderful opportunities for mission and ministry here at St. Mary's. One of them is coming up on our calendar in just a few weeks, the block party, which uh, we usually reserve for the absolute hottest day of the year. Oh, we're not doing that anymore. Uh, we are going to have it on Sunday, October the 1st, and there are invitations that will be given to every home within a two-block radius of this church building. Um, the church obviously extends, extends far beyond uh, the walls of this place. And so if you would be uh, interested in being a part of extending that personal invitation to our literal neighbors, um, please see Holly Warren, who's right back there. She's waving. Um, she has a little packet of invitations that can be picked up. There's a little map that shows a piece of our neighborhood uh, that is highlighted. And if you could go over and just extend an invitation to the folks in that little packet, that would be a great gift. The goal, of course, is to get these invitations out as soon as possible, starting today. Um, so see her if you would be interested in being a part of that. A couple of other pastoral uh, things to share. Bob Bright and the Hazel Grove family as well celebrate the birth of Mary Lane. She was born to Myers uh, a couple weeks ago, I believe, and so we just celebrate that new life and a joy that she brings to their family. And also, uh, a, a piece of news for this worshiping congregation as well as the broader church, Stephen Mazingo, who's a child of St. Mary's, is now a priest, has been a priest for some time, and is uh, newly installed as the rector at Calvary Episcopal Church in Tarboro. I had the blessing of being able to go and be a part of that this past Thursday, and so I celebrate with the Mazingo family uh, and with the people of that congregation and the Diocese of North Carolina. It's just so good to have him uh, and their family sharing in ministry this close to us again. It is good for us to be together again today, friends, and our liturgy will begin in just a moment. Our opening hymn is number 390, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Welcome.
be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, because without you we are not able to please you, mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. Genesis. <clears throat> Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him, and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people, as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. The word of the Lord. Let us read this portion of Psalm 103 as found in your bulletin, responsively by half verse. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul. He forgives all your sins. He redeems your life from the grave. 
He satisfies you with good things. The Lord executes righteousness. He made his ways known to Moses. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. He will not always accuse us. He will not deal with us according to our sins. For as the heavens are high above the earth, as far as the east is from the west, As a father cares for his children, a reading from the letter of St. Paul to the church in Rome, welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling your opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord, and those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you, seventy seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, 
one who owed him 10,000 talents, was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to the Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. Please pray with me. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation and thoughts of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Lewis Smedes, who wrote the book called The Art of Forgiving, once said, that to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover, discover that the prisoner is you. If you hadn't picked up on the main topic of today's scriptures so far today, it is indeed forgiveness. In fact, forgiveness is the absolute heart of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ for you and for me and for every person ever. Matthew West wrote his song called Forgiveness after being inspired by an incredible story that he heard. It's the story of a woman named Renee who had every right, if there ever was such a thing, to hate a man. His name is Eric. Eric was 23 years old when he had too much to drink one night and got into his car and crashed into another vehicle, killing both of that other vehicle's passengers. One of those people was Renee's daughter, Megan, who was 20 years old herself. And we can only imagine how crushed Renee was when she heard the news. In what must have been a blur, the next thing that she knew, she was in a courtroom watching Eric get convicted of his crimes and sentenced to 22 years in prison. And there was a moment when the judge and members of the jury, some of them, even told Renee that it was okay to hold on to the rage and to the anger 
that she harbored. And she did. But even after the conviction, Renee found herself in the darkest place that she had ever known. Now, she had received justice. Right? The perpetrator of the crimes had been arrested and lawfully convicted. And, and let's just pause for a moment and acknowledge here that there are so many instances where not even this happens. Right? For all kinds of reasons, justice is not guaranteed in this world. And yet, even though Eric was behind bars, Renee said she felt like a prisoner because she had hatred and bitterness towards this young man. And this is when the incredible begins to happen. She felt convicted in her heart from her very core to reach out to Eric in prison, and she told him, I forgive you. And the ripple effects of that action are still being felt today. We, we can only imagine how he felt in that moment, too. He said, I can't even forgive myself, and yet she, of all people, forgave me? But there's more. One by one, the members of Renee's family started to do the same thing. As their hearts softened and turned, they reached out and forgave Eric, so much so that they have even come to call Eric a member of their family, like a son to them. And while you, like I, I'm sure, are trying to wrap your brain around that, here's another part of the story. Renee, along with her family, went back to the court, and they were able to have Eric's sentence cut in half from 22 years to 11 years. And Eric spent a moment with Renee before that hearing, and he said that even if the judge doesn't grant this reduction of sentence, I want you to know that I'm going to be okay. I will be fine. He was just blown away that she and her family were willing to do that for him. That, of course, is an incredible, an amazing example of the power of forgiveness, not only as an act by those who have been hurt towards those who have hurt them, but it also casts a light on how our hearts, all of our hearts, need to be set free from the pain and the hurt of every kind of sin and brokenness. And that's exactly why Jesus emphasizes to his followers, and I use the present tense here, he emphasizes to not only those who walked with him literally 2,000 years ago in first century Palestine, but also to every one of us today who would strive to follow in the way of Jesus. Jesus emphasizes forgiveness as a hallmark of his way of living. So what's going on in the gospel lesson that we heard this morning? What is the context? Of course, that is a question we always need to ask as we open up the scriptures to read. As Matthew tells this story, Jesus and his followers have taken his disciples on what might be called a road trip, right? They are traveling throughout the roads of the region, and they are meeting people. They're hearing the stories of their people. And Jesus is teaching and preaching about the kingdom of God. He's teaching them about God and about how God wants his creation to be and to live. How God wants people to live together in relationship, not only with each other, but with the rest of creation and with God. And sometimes on this road trip, there are miracles involved, right? Physical healings and unexplainable feedings of crowds. And through it all, Jesus is also teaching his close inner circle about what this all means and how they are to live too. And just before this part of the gospel that we picked up this morning, Jesus talks about how his followers are to try to handle conflict among their communities. So a lot of churches read that part of the scripture last Sunday. We did not read it here in this church last Sunday because we were reading the scriptures for the Feast of St. Mary's. But we can't really understand today's gospel without knowing the context. They're just finishing talking about how to live together 
in conflict and how to deal with that. And so how, when there is an offense between believers, that offense is to be handled? Well, one way it's not to be handled, it's not supposed to be just shrugged off or brushed under the table. Rather, it is to be addressed, but in a particular way, right? starting with the smallest possible impact to the community, starting with a conversation between the two parties that are involved. And then if it is not resolved in that way, then, then bringing another individual to help resolve it, and only widening that circle only as it is needed. We could, of course, go into much more detail here, but especially I would be remiss if I didn't point out clearly at this moment now that within the Christian community, if a situation is not able to be quickly resolved, that the process that Jesus holds out for us all is to make it so that a victim is never to be alone with a perpetrator again. There is always someone else present to protect and to mediate as things are hoped to be worked out. So may we never think that Jesus wants us to be okay with a wrong that has been done, that we have to, quote, take it for Jesus or something, as some teachings have led communities and individuals to believe. Absolutely not. Right? Forgiveness and reconciliation can only happen through dealing with what has happened and doing so in a way that is safe and protective and remediative for its most vulnerable members. Do you hear this? Is this, are we on board with this? And it's at this point that one of the disciples, Peter, wants to get some clarification because, you know, of course, this work of reconciliation with those who have hurt you is really hard. And it can be extremely exhausting. He may be thinking to himself, you know, this is a hard thing to go through one time, and there's no guarantee that a person who has wronged you one time isn't going to do it again, right? So how many times does Jesus expect us to go through this? Now, a little backstory, there is a Jesus rabbinical teaching from that time period that even says specifically, forgiveness should be offered three times, and after that, you're not on the hook anymore. Now, that's not in the scriptures. That's just a rabbinical teaching that has been found from that time. And so it could be that Peter might even be looking for a little pat on the back here by going above and beyond that standard when he says, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Right? That's way more than three. On top of that, seven can also be like a code word, right? A code word to mean a lot. It's the number that represents fulfillment or completion, right? But Jesus sees Peter's exaggeration, and he goes further. No, Peter, not seven, but I tell you, 77 times. Some translations say seven times seven, or 49 times, or 70 times seven, right? Some combination of that to just nail down the point it's a lot of times. There's not a set number. Infinite times. And then, as Jesus does, he tells a parable to really emphasize the point. In this parable, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like this. God is like this. There's a king who calls in someone who owes him a lot of debt in order to settle it. And the amount that is owed by this person is 10,000 talents. Now, why most of our Bible translations you still use the word talent here to refer to a monetary figure, I'm not sure. It is a monetary amount. It's not something that we use that word in that way today, but it refers to an incredible sum of money, right? Some translations say that the amount of money here is several lifetimes worth of the average worker's wage. It could be an amount of gold. Other translations talk about gold. It could be an amount of gold greater than all of the gold in the Roman Empire at the time. So in my technical mind, right, I would translate it like this. I would say it's a gazillion, okay? It's a gazillion dollars. Y'all with me? No one would have this much gold. And it begs the question, first, who has that much money ever? And second, who would loan this much money out? How would anyone even get into debt like that? 
And right here, if, if you haven't already, I invite you to join me in imagining yourself in the place of the servant who is in debt. And the king is God. Because this is us. Right? Consider this. The debt isn't just the things we've done wrong. The debt isn't just the ways that we have quote-unquote sinned. Right? The debt also includes all of the things that the king or God has ever just given to the servant. Us. Don't, don't only think about what you have done not so well. Think also of all of your worldly possessions, all of the things that you own outright. Chances are that doesn't add up to more than all of the gold of the Roman Empire, okay? But now add on top of that the ground on which you walk and the flowers that add beauty to your life and the trees that give the shade that you enjoy. And to that, add the water in the rivers and the oceans that make all of life possible. And add to that the air that you're breathing. And add to that the worth of the people that you share life with, which of course is priceless. And then add to that the moon and the sun and the stars. Right? You're getting the image here. This is worth more than any amount of gold because these things are priceless. And so the king says, you owe me everything. And because you owe me all this, I'm going to sell you into slavery until you pay me back. And the man begs, please have mercy on me. Please give me more time and I'll pay you back everything I owe. Now, that's nuts too. I mean, there's no way that you could ever pay back all of this. How much time do you need? You, you couldn't ever do it. But the point here is that the Lord looks on this person and does what? Shows mercy and lets him go. He doesn't say, okay, I'll give you more time, but you still owe it. No, he says the debt is forgiven completely out of his mercy and pity. Now, as Jesus' story unfolds, it appears as though the king has made a tremendous mistake in doing this. Because if the idea here is that this amazing grace that has been shown to the servant is to result in a person now living gracefully, then it didn't work. It doesn't actually result in a positive change in the man's life that we can discern at all. The very next thing that this guy does is to be incredibly cruel to someone who owed him a much smaller amount. Receiving forgiveness does not transform this person. And that bothers us because when something good happens to someone, they're supposed to pay it forward, right? But we are supposed to pay it forward. And the parable that Jesus tells ends up wrapping up really harshly. It's, it's not a way that we would want this parable to end at all, right? The servant who received money showed, or who received mercy showed no compassion. To the person who owed him, and the king, in response, requires the full debt to be paid. And Jesus tells us this in order to emphasize that he also, what he also taught in the Lord's Prayer, right? the prayer that we are invited to pray every single day, that our forgiveness from God is somehow connected to the forgiveness that we offer others from our hearts. Right? Forgive us this day. Forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. Jesus doesn't tell this parable or teach about forgiveness simply because it is good advice that will make life better or easier for us. He tells us about forgiveness because it is the absolute heart of the gospel, the good news that Jesus came to bring. Forgiveness is how we learn the heart of God, for us and for everyone else. Our dearest friends, as well as the people who have hurt us the most. Because the truth is that we are like that first servant. There's no possible way that any of us could ever earn the life and the existence that we have with its countless mercies and blessings. And whatever debt that we owe, that debt has been paid fully once and for all, by the only human being that could ever pay what we owe. Jesus, fully man and fully God, on the cross. 
And it's very hard for us to believe that we don't have to do anything in order to be saved. That we can't do anything to earn it, but that is exactly what the gospel is. We're called to forgive a multitude of times. And if we're called to do this, how many times will God forgive us? Infinite. God's forgiveness is absolute. God's salvation is without any cost. I mentioned that among the countless gifts that we have been given is the air that we breathe. Tom Wright once said that forgiveness itself is like the air, having been breathed into your lungs. And there's only room for you to inhale the next lungful when you have breathed out the previous one. So if you insist on withholding forgiveness, you won't be able to take any more in yourself, and you will suffocate very quickly. So whatever the spiritual or moral or emotional equivalent of lungs that there may be, it's either open or it's closed. If it's open, able and willing to forgive others, it will also be open to receive God's love and forgiveness. But if it's locked up to the one, it will be locked up to the other. So Jesus tells us today to breathe deeply. Breathe deeply the breaths of forgiveness received by God and given to others. I've said these things to you this day in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, I invite you to stand as you are able as we affirm our faith through the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, Light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified, he has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Rob, our diocesan bishop, Tom, our rector, Greg, our assisting clergy, John, our candidate for holy orders, and for all bishops, priests, and deacons.
We pray for Joe, our president, Roy, our governor, Don, our mayor, and for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Have compassion on all who are named on the St. Mary's prayer list and on all who suffer from any grief or trouble. Give to the departed eternal rest. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. In our parish cycle of prayer, we pray for Mary's Kitchen. Thank you, Lord, for the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that leads your people to be part of daily bread being provided to anyone seeking a warm meal at Mary's Kitchen. No questions asked. Please bless the kitchen's guests volunteers, donors, board of directors, cook, Mark Moore, and executive director, Jim Godfrey. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand as you are able. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you.
be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of us all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace, and that the last day bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people 
of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Every breath is a gift. We only have so many moments to gladden the hearts of those who traveled away with us. So be swift to love. Make haste to be kind. And the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.